introduce myself. There's, okay. Uh, as the uh, management has delayed this session, we have to catch flights, so I'm gonna get started. Uh, I'm the only dentist presenting here, so uh, it is about periodontitis, and I have to give you a little bit of introduction what periodontitis is, because most of you uh, probably are not aware of this. Uh, periodontitis is also known as gum disease. It's a chronic inflammatory disease of surrounding structures of teeth caused by gram-negative anaerobic microorganisms and immune response, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, to ward off the anaerobic microorganism and its products are also responsible for some tissue destruction. And HANES, which is National Health and Nutritional Survey in 2009 in the United States showed that almost 45% of the U.S. population has some form of periodontal disease. 30% of these have moderate to advanced gum disease and it has been associated with coronary artery disease premature low birth babies, and type 2 diabetes. And the strongest risk factors for periodontitis or gum disease are type 2 diabetes and smoking. Prevalence of type 2 diabetes has been discussed since yesterday and estimates are that there will be 300 million or more type 2 diabetics around the world by 2025, an equal number will be pre-diabetics. Even just in India, I think there is going to be more than 100 million people suffering from diabetes. Evidence of relationship between diabetes and periodontitis has been there since 1982. These are mostly cross-sectional studies which looked at diabetic patients and also periodontal disease. So what they found was there was more severe, more prevalent, periodontitis in people with diabetes and there is as the number of years people have had diabetes there is more severe periodontal disease and then there is a study from US which was done on Pima Indians which are this population genetically predisposed to diabetes and they found that there's very high prevalence of attachment loss bone loss around the teeth to Point eight or three times more likely to loss of attachment, three times more likely to radiographic really bone loss, and they also have a very high prevalence of loss of teeth. Then there is a study recently from Saudi Arabia actually, which showed they compared 78 normal matched subjects to 80 uh, diabetic subjects, and they found that there is there was more prevalence of and um, more severe disease pattern periodontitis in diabetic patients. And then there's a recent study from Bangalore, India, epidemiological study, and they looked at uh, 490 patients, and they found that well-controlled, moderately controlled, poorly controlled patients, and that is a very arbitrary uh, kind of classification. Well-controlled to them was about 7% uh, A1C, and moderately controlled was 7.128, and then over that was poorly controlled. And the odds ratio becomes higher as the, as the A1C level goes up. And then there's a study, meta-analysis was done in Holland, where they looked at 639 studies, uh, and out of those, there were only five suitable studies with 371 patients. And what they did was they did the intervention of uh, periodontitis treatment. And usually periodontitis treatment consider, uh, consists of impeccable oral hygiene, thorough brightment, sometime antibiotics, uh, resective or regenerative surgeries, and long-term maintenance. However, uh, because of limited number of patients and confidence level was low and they could show, although there was a reduction of 1.17% with pattern therapy in A1C. These are the A A1C values uh, proposed by American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists guidelines in 2011. And in Canada and USA, 5.4% A1C is considered normal. And then you have, you have the list, and I don't need to repeat for you because you all know about these. 
So conventional target to minimize microvascular and macrovascular complications, nephropathy and retropathy have been standardized to A1C level of less than 7%. Physicians use many factors to individualize glycemic targets for patients ranging from A1C level 6.5 to 8.5% 8, 8 plus. And they take into consideration various factors of life expectancy expectancy, age, duration of diabetes, comorbidities like coronary heart disease, chronic kidney disease, risk of ischemic events, history of recurrent hypoglycemia, level of functional dependency, patient attitude and motivation, patient resources and support system. However, uh, and, and, and most of the patients which are diabetic may not be as well controlled, but they continue to give the medication, insulin, all uh, medications, uh, and recently, uh, sodium uh, glucose uh, co-transported co, co 2 inhibitors have been introduced and they have reduced the adverse events uh, greatly in, in these uh, diabetic patients who are not well controlled with the A1C. So uh, we know that glycan hemoglobin gives a time indication of elevated blood glucose status over the life cycle of red blood cells, which is half-life is 30 to 90 days. And when this glycated uh, hemoglobin, which is also called uh, advanced glycated end product, is uh, binds to receptors on, of this age on monocytes and macrophages, these are some of the effects which happen. PM and function defects, insulin resistance, vascular, vascular changes, decreased ability to cope with an infection, poor moon healing due to vascular and collagen changes, and treatment is proper glycemic control. Inflammatory mediators in diabetic patients who are not well controlled so far A1C is concerned, and they have inflammatory mediator levels many, many times higher than normal patients of increased interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1b, interleukin-6, and PGE2. And all these inflammatory mediators are involved in periodontitis and destruction of tissues around the teeth. Just to give you an example, what happens on your left, uh, on, your, on your right, there's a normal patient which has uh, no gum disease or dead periodontitis. And on the other, uh, on, the, on the left side of your left side, there is a patient who has who is a diabetic and has a very advanced gum disease. And although this uh, may not show on uh, this picture, these gums are red and there are some, very frequently there are periodontal abscesses around these teeth. And what I'm showing you is, it has been estimated now that in a generalized advanced periodontitis case, the periodontal inflammatory surface area, which is ulcerated, is much higher, and there are indeed they have calculated actually uh, that this uh, area is much higher. It reflects surface area of bleeding pockets, epithelium, and skin millimeters. The surface area of bleeding pocket epithelium quantifies the amount of inflamed periodontal tissue and reflects the inflammatory burden posed by periodontitis. So you can well imagine that you have a patient of advanced periodontitis, and you have so much inflammation. And the estimates are, as a lay, for the layman, if you take your forearm and scrape the whole skin off and then throw 50 million uh, anaerobic gram-negative bacteria on it, that's the kind of bacterial inflammatory burden these patients have. And the same people have shown, there's a comparison of periodontal inflammatory surface area between healthy patient versus with advanced generalized periodontitis. So it's quite heavy bacterial burden. So I'm just presenting a few cases. Uh, case number one, this is overweight female, 40 years old, Caucasian female, deep red color of dingle unit with complaints of gum boil, which is periodontal abscess. A medical referral is indicated and glycated hemoglobin tested elevated is, uh, it level is nine milli, it should be 9%, not milligram percent, my apologies. And here are the clinical pictures and if you don't, we don't have the pointer, but if you look at upper, uh, uh, the right panel, 
on the breast, the corner teeth, upper and lower the parietal abscess. This patient has about eight parietal abscesses in, in, in her mouth. And this is again another picture of the same patient. And it shows the inside of the teeth, which are gums are very much inflamed. And as I've indicated, that parietal inflammatory surface area will be, as the disease progresses, as it's become more advanced, there's more bacterial burden on, on the patient. And this is the radiographs, which are showing advanced bone loss on the teeth. And I don't have the point, otherwise the point. This bone level should be very close to the neck of the teeth rather than 50% lower. So this patient has lost a lot of pain, bone around this uh, heart teeth. Another patient, 50-year-old Caucasian female, infrequent dental care, both parents have pregnant diabetes in early age. And of course, her gums are very extremely sore, pain in lower right, and she complained that gums bleed on brushing for past three to four months. When she wakes up in the morning, with, she has blood on her pillow. One AC level is more than 11%. And no wonder she has very advanced gum disease and nothing is working because physician could not control her blood sugar level. This is a composite picture of her uh, mouth and very, very inflamed tissues. And this is a composite picture inside and outside, breathing and probing. You could blow air on the, her gums and it, it would bleed. And look at just this inflamed tissue. This is the kind of inflammation you get in uncontrolled diabetic patients around their gums. And there's advanced bone loss, you will see in the next slide probably. And this is a composite picture. There's more than 75% bone loss around her teeth. And we tried everything. We did initial treatment, antibiotics, and uh, we all but felt that bone loss is so advanced that surgical intervention will not help. I hate to say this, I hate to admit that we tried everything, but she was on a downhill course, and because of uncontrolled one AC level, she was going to probably lose all her teeth and already probably have lost her teeth. Now, uh, the point I want to make for this presentation is, here is a case I saw about, 30, uh, about six years back. It's a 38-year-old Caucasian female, a little bit overweight, and with no indication that her 1AC level is elevated. When I saw her, I diagnosed her as generalized advanced periodontitis and asked her if she has had her blood glucose level tested. And she said no, and I sent her to the physician. It came back that they felt that there was no need for any intervention. Last month, this patient came back. We, we treated her with surgical treatment, brought her under control so her parentitis was concerned, and maintained her for six years with a three to four months recall program. Here is her radiographs, and you can see some bone loss around all of her teeth, but we have, we have been able to control it. The story is the 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 Interesting thing is that six years later, she came last month to get her maintenance, and she said, you told me that I may be diabetic six years back. Now I've been di diagnosed as type two diabetic. So what I'm here to uh, promote and speak with you, that you, and this, this is actually a donogram, is a record that we can, these red lines show the loss of attachment, loss of bone in this patient, how deep the pockets were. So what is missing in this whole, whole thing? What is the precise level of 1AC where pregnant health can be maintained compared to non-diabetics? In US and Canada, patients see dentists much more frequently as compared to what, when they see uh, their physicians. So my, I'm, I'm asking you, and I'm asking my co dental colleagues as well, can a diagnosis of severe pregnant disease be an opportunistic screening test for undiagnosed diabetics and pre-diabetic patients? Because we see them much more frequently. If we see this kind of disease, I personally, I practice uh, in my practice because I have an academic appointment as well. 
about four to five days a month. Every time I'm in my clinic, I diagnose an undiag undiagnosed diabetic patient, just looking at their gums and doing a parental examination. So I'm uh, asking, should physician be asking about oral health? Uh, collaboration between physician and periodontist, periodontist or dentist is needed and my feeling is that if we all collaborate uh, we can diagnose many many more undiagnosed cases. Thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I guess I'm the only dentist so uh, but keep in mind that uh, you all of you have cohorts of uh, a large number of uh, diabetic patients you can get you can engage your dental colleagues and uh, really really make a difference uh, in diagnosis and uh, yeah you have to ask a question next okay go ahead this is very interesting to me actually uh, i just wonder what what advice could we provide for patients for prevention uh, First of all, the diagnosis has to be made what level of disease the patient has. And then, of course, your dental colleagues should be involved. They should start treating them. Impeccable oral hygiene, three times brushing, flossing every day. But you can do all of that if their 1A, A1C level is not under control. It's not going to work. So better control of diabetes, the best prevention. Control and regular dental care and involve most, most of the times, if it is advanced disease, it won't be done by a family dentist, it will be a periodontist like me, a specialist. Thank you very much. Thank you.